This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. So you may have been following all of this hubbub about Knight First Amendment Institute, about public forums, about Twitter being a designated public forum or Facebook being a designated public forum and the state action doctrine that surrounds that. We just talked about the Rutenberg v. Twitter case. You can see that in a bubble up there. And now we have the Supreme Court ruling on that Twitter blocking case where former President Donald Trump blocked people on Twitter but then the Knight First Amendment Institute sued and the court said that he couldn't block people and that, that, that government actors cannot block people from their Twitter accounts. Well, the Supreme Court has now ruled on that or, or rather sort of not ruled. They granted the writ of certiorari, which is the certification to the Supreme Court, and then immediately in two sentences vacated the lower court's opinions and remanded the case to the appeals court for the Second Circuit with instructions to dismiss miss the case as moot and that's it that's that's the entire opinion of the court it is just that the case is moot well what does that mean before we get to the meat of justice clarence thomas's concurrence which is the more interesting part this mootness doctrine means that the case is no longer ripe for review and the basis for that isn't stated here but just the legal reasoning behind it would have to be that this was a lawsuit about former President Trump on Twitter blocking people and he's no longer the president and he no longer has a usable account. His account has been permanently suspended. So where's the controversy? There is a case or controversy requirement in the U.S. Constitution that requires that the federal courts, which are courts of limited jurisdiction, in other words, the federal courts don't hear all cases. They only hear cases that they've been given jurisdiction over. And one of those limitations on jurisdiction is that they can only hear cases or controversies. And case law has ruled that cases or controversies have to be live cases or controversies, not prospective cases or controversies that might happen in the future, and not past cases and controversies that have no remedy that can make any meaningful adjudication or judgment against the action. So the Prospective cases are not ripe. The past cases with no remedy are moot. And so they're now saying that even if they were to rule on the Knight First Amendment Institute versus Trump case, it's moot. There's no more thing to be done. They can't order Donald Trump to unblock people because he's suspended. He can't unblock people. Even if he was reinstated, he's not the president, so he can block all the people he want. He's not a state actor anymore. So now the case is moot. And that seems like a bit of a cop-out, but maybe they could have just denied certiorari instead of granting it and then ruling the case is moot, thus invalidating the precedent. Uh, maybe this is just the, they didn't like the case because it wasn't the best case in the world. There was a lot of confusion over which part of Twitter was a designated public forum. I definitely have had lots of commenters on this channel confusing the ruling, saying that because the Knight First Amendment Institute case ruled that Trump can't block people. That means no one can block anyone. That was not true. It was because Trump was a, a state actor, was he was, he was public official, and that he had turned his Twitter account into the venue through which he was making presidential proclamations. So because he had taken that extra step, that turned it into a state actor or state action public forum of sorts. But that didn't mean that all of Twitter was a public forum. And there's a lot of confusion around this. So maybe the court thought, let's just get rid of that because it's not a super clear case. And instead of writing a whole dissertation on state action and all that, we have plenty of case law on it. Let's just deny this as moot and get it done with. But Justice Clarence Thomas, <laughs> well, he disagrees a little bit. He wanted to write something a little bit longer. And so there's another 11 pages here, maybe 12 pages of Justice Clarence Thomas's concurrence 
where he wants to add something to this. And I may disagree with this. I may not. I haven't fully read through it yet. So let's read through it together. And then I will pause here and there and give my opinions. And you can give your opinions in the comments below. He writes, when a person publishes a message on the social media platform Twitter, the platform by default enables others to republish, retweet the message or respond, reply to it or other replies in a designated comment thread. The user who generates the original message can manually block others from republishing or responding. Donald Trump, then president of the United States, blocked several users from interacting with his Twitter account. They sued. The Second Circuit held that the comment threads were a public forum and that then President Trump violated the First Amendment by using his control of the Twitter account to block the plaintiffs from accessing the comment threads. But Mr. Trump, it turned out, had only limited control of the account. Twitter has permanently removed the account from the platform. Because of the change in presidential administration, the court correctly vacates the Second Circuit's decision. I write separately to note that this petition highlights the principal legal difficulty that surrounds digital platforms, namely that applying old doctrines to new digital platforms is rarely straightforward. Respondents have a point, for example, that some aspects of Mr. Trump's account resemble a constitutionally protected public forum. But it seems rather odd to say that something is a government forum when a private company has unrestricted authority to do away with it. The disparity between Twitter's control and Mr. Trump's control is stark, to say the least. Mr. Trump blocked several people from interacting with his messages. Twitter barred Mr. Trump not only from interacting with a few users, but removed him from the entire platform, thus barring all Twitter users from interacting with his messages. At the time, Mr. Trump's Twitter account had 89 million followers. Under its terms of service, Twitter can remove any person from the platform, including the President of the United States, at any time for any or no reason. That's from the user agreement effective June 18th, 2020. This is not the first or only case to raise issues about digital platforms. While this case involves a suit against a public official, the court properly rejects today a separate petition alleging that digital platforms, not individuals on those platforms, violated public accommodation laws, the First Amendment, and antitrust laws. The petitions highlight two important facts. Today's digital platforms provide avenues for historically unprecedented amounts of speech, including speech by government actors. Also unprecedented, however, is the concentrated control of so much speech in the hands of a few private parties. We will soon have no choice but to address how our legal doctrines apply to highly concentrated privately owned information infrastructure, such as digital platforms. On the surface, some aspects of Mr. Trump's Twitter account resembled a public forum. A designated public forum is property that the state has opened for expressive activity by part or all of the public. Mr. Trump often used the account to speak in his official capacity. And as a government official, he chose to make the comment threads on his account publicly accessible, allowing any Twitter user other than those whom he blocked to respond to his posts. Yet the Second Circuit's conclusion that Mr. Trump's Twitter account was a public forum is in tension with, among other things, our frequent description of public forums as government-controlled spaces. Any control Mr. Trump exercised over the account greatly paled in comparison to Twitter's authority dictated in its terms of service to remove the account at any time for any or no reason. Twitter exercised its authority to do exactly that. Now here's where I have my first disagreement with Justice Clarence Thomas. The disparity of power here doesn't really have anything to do with the state action doctrine. The state action doctrine is about whether the government has opened a government controlled space. And so, yes, Trump's account was controlled by Trump within the terms of service of Twitter. So while Twitter permitted him to speak on the premises, think of like a stadium or a conference center, while Twitter permitted him to be there, he had control over what he said and who he said it too, and who was allowed to retweet, who was allowed to comment, who he was allowed to block. So that's where I have a disagreement. The justice seems to think that the disparity of power here takes it out of the state action doctrine. I think the two are quite easily distinguished. Because unbridled control of the account resided in the hands of a private party, First Amendment doctrine may not have applied to respondents' complaint of stifled speech. 
Whether governmental use of a private space implicates the First Amendment often depends on the government's control over that space. For example, a government agency that leases a conference room in a hotel to hold a public hearing about proposed regulation cannot kick participants out of the hotel simply because they express concerns about the new regulation. So that, at first glance, that seems to agree with me. A government agency that leases a conference room in a hotel for a public hearing cannot kick participants out because they express differing opinions. But government officials who informally gather with constituents in a hotel bar can ask the hotel to remove a pesky patron who elbows into the gathering to loudly voice his views. The difference is that the government controls the space in the first scenario, the hotel in the latter. Whereas here, private parties control the avenues for speech, our law has typically addressed concerns about stifled speech through other legal doctrines, which may have a secondary effect on the application of the first. First Amendment. So that's a good clarification, but that seems to support my view and not what it looks like Justice Thomas is concerned about. Now, maybe he's just making the argument and not taking a position, but I'm firmly on the side that when the former president used his Twitter account to make presidential pro proclamations, that that's a public hearing situation more than it is a hotel bar situation from this previous paragraph. If part of the problem is private, concentrated control over online content and platforms available to the public, then part of the solution may be found in doctrines that limit the right of a private company to exclude. Historically, at least two legal doctrines limited a company's right to exclude. First, our legal system and its British predecessor have long subjected certain businesses known as common carriers to special regulations, including a general requirement to serve all comers. Now here's where it gets interesting because we've currently got this argument over whether internet providers are common carriers. So I think you're going to notice that Justice Thomas skips over internet service providers and goes straight to websites as common carriers. Wouldn't the internet service providers need to be common carriers as well? Wouldn't they, in the Venn diagram, wouldn't the little sub-circle of website common carriers need to be within a larger circle of providers as common carriers? So isn't Justice Clarence Thomas making the argument here that the internet itself should be a public utility, that ISPs should be common carriers? Isn't Clarence Thomas making the argument for net neutrality? Justifications for these regulations have varied. Some scholars have argued that common carrier regulations are justified only when a carrier possesses substantial market power. Others have said that no substantial market power is needed so long as the company holds itself out as open to the public. And this court long ago suggested that regulations like those placed on common carriers may be justified even for industries not historically recognized as common carriers when a business by circumstances and its nature rises from private to be of public concern. At that point, a company's property is but its instrument, the means of rendering the service which has become of public interest. This latter definition, of course, is hardly helpful, for most things can be described as of public interest. But whatever may be said of other industries, there is clear historical precedent for regulating transportation and communications networks in a similar manner as traditional common carriers. Telegraphs, for example, because they resembled railroad companies and other common carriers, were bound to serve all customers alike, without discrimination. He's making a strong argument that internet service providers should be common carriers and they should be net neutral. They should be bound to serve all customers. I'm not sure if he realizes he's making this argument. He does note this court has been inconsistent about whether telegraphs were common carriers, but the court has consistently recognized that telegraphs were at least analogous enough to common carriers to be regulated similarly. Telegraphs historically received some protection from defamation suits. Unlike other entities that might retransmit defamatory content, they were liable only if they knew or had reason to know that a message they distributed was defamatory, which sounds a little bit like Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. In exchange for regulating transportation and communication industries, governments, both state and federal, have sometimes given common carriers special government favors. For example, governments have tied restrictions on a common carrier's ability to reject clients 
compliance to immunity from certain types of suits, or to regulations that make it more difficult for other companies to compete with the carrier, such as a franchise license. By giving these companies special privileges, governments place them into a category distinct from other companies and closer to some functions, like the postal service, that the state has traditionally undertaken. Okay, but are FedEx and UPS considered common carriers? I don't know, I'll have to look that up and maybe I'll put something up on the screen here and do a voiceover. Second, governments have limited a company's right to exclude when that company is a public accommodation. This concept related to common carrier law applies to companies that hold themselves out to the public but do not carry freight, passengers, or communications. It also applies regardless of a company's market power. Internet platforms, of course, have their own First Amendment interests, but regulations that might affect speech are valid if they would have been permissible at the time of the founding. The long history of this country, and in England, of restricting the exclusion right of common carriers and places of public accommodation, in other words, the ability to exclude anyone they want to, may save similar regulations today from triggering heightened scrutiny. Heightened scrutiny is the standard of constitutional... Uh, evaluation of a government action, that the law or regulation is necessary to achieve a compelling state interest, as opposed to what would be standard scrutiny, where the government action is just related to a state interest. Especially where a restriction would not prohibit the company from speaking or force the company to endorse the speech. There is a fair argument that some digital platforms are sufficiently akin to common carriers or places of public accommodation to be regulated in this manner. So yeah, I, I think he is taking a position that Facebook and Twitter and Parler and, and others who claim to be serving all customers within their terms of service are places of public accommodation and are regulable like common carriers. But again, wouldn't the internet service providers themselves and the internet need to be net neutral, need to be common carriers themselves? And hasn't that been a fight that we've been having the past two decades? In many ways, digital platforms that hold themselves out to the public resemble traditional common carriers. Though digital instead of physical, they are at bottom communications networks, and they carry information from one user to another. A traditional telephone company laid physical wires to create a network connecting people. Digital platforms lay information infrastructure that can be controlled in much the same way. And unlike newspapers, digital platforms hold themselves out as organizations that focus on distributing the speech of the broader public. Federal law dictates that companies cannot be treated as the publisher or speaker of information that they merely distribute. The analogy to common carriers is even clearer for digital platforms that have dominant market share. Similar to utilities, today's dominant digital platforms derive much of their value from network size. The internet, of course, is a network, but these digital platforms are networks within that network. See what I mean? The, their, their Venn diagram, they're, they're smaller, they're a subset of a larger Venn diagram. The internet would be the larger circle, and the service providers would be within that circle, and then these digital platforms would be within that. So if they are common carriers, so does the internet, and the service providers have to be common carriers. The Facebook suite of apps is valuable largely because 3 billion people use it. Google search at 90% of market share is valuable relative to other search engines because more people use it, creating data that Google's algorithm uses to refine and improve search results. These network effects entrench these companies. Ordinarily, the astronomical profit margins of these platforms uh, last year, Google was 182.5 billion, 40 billion in net income, would induce new entrants into the market. That these companies have no comparable competitors highlights that the industries may have substantial barriers to entry. To be sure, much activity on the internet derives value from network effects, but dominant digital platforms are different. Unlike decentralized digital spheres such as the email protocol, control of these networks is highly concentrated. Although both companies are public, one person controls Facebook and just two control Google, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Um, I don't know, does the CEO control the company or is it the board that controls the company? Certainly the CEO has substantial weight, but wouldn't the board be the, the board of directors be the entity in control of the company? No small group of people controls email. 
Much like with a communications utility, this concentration gives some digital platforms enormous control over speech. When a user does not already know exactly where to find something on the internet, and users rarely do, Google is the gatekeeper between that user and the speech of others 90% of the time. I also find this to be a very interesting discussion because Justice Thomas's political stance is more of the free market political stance. And here he is saying that instead of letting the free market decide through competition, we should regulate. So it's very interesting to be a free market advocate advocating for bigger government regulation. It can suppress content by de-indexing or downlisting or delisting a search result or by steering users away from certain content by manually altering autocomplete results. Facebook and Twitter can generally narrow a person's information flow through similar means, and as the distributor of the clear majority of ebooks and about half of all physical books, Amazon can impose cataclysmic consequences on authors by, among other things, blocking a listing. This is both true and not true at the same time. If the general public subscribes to Cosmopolitan magazine as their only source of information, does that make Cosmopolitan magazine a common carrier, or is it just that the general public likes that magazine? And if Cosmopolitan spins things in a certain direction, is that designated public forum common carrier state action? Or is that just that a whole bunch of people really liked the magazine? Now, yes, I get that the numbers that are involved here are much larger than Cosmopolitan's subscriber base, but think about it. If everyone chose to get their news from one source, like Facebook or Twitter or Google or Reddit or YouTube, does that mean that those are automatically a designated public forum or common carrier? I don't think so. I, I think that that Justice Thomas is, is overlooking the inherent competition with having these digital platforms. It being digital allows them to be more ubiquitous. Sure, it's an easier distribution method, but having a powerful voice from a private entity in the past certainly never made anyone a public forum or a common carrier. It was the communication networks, which would be the internet, which would be the service providers, the telegraph company. If a company used the telegraph network to host communications, if, if I had a Twitter-like company, and when you sent me a message, I would post that message through the Telegraph system. Does that make me the designated public forum? No, it makes the Telegraph system the designated public forum. So what he's actually advocating for here is that the internet should be free and open and net neutral. The internet should be the designated public forum. He's actually making the argument for the internet, not for Twitter and Facebook and Parler. It changes nothing that these platforms are not the sole means for distributing speech or information. A person always could choose to avoid the toll bridge or train and instead swim the Charles River or hike the Oregon Trail. Again, the bridge or the train, those are the carriers. Those are the service providers. The messaging platform is the cargo that goes on the train and it's from one company and the train is still open to other cargo. It's just that there's one company who has been very good at getting customers to go through them as a middleman to get to the common carrier. So it's a, it's a little bit of conflate. It's a lot. It's actually a lot of conflation, a lot of confusion going on here. I think he's trying to make the argument that the internet should be designated as public or common carrier or net neutral and not actually Twitter or Facebook. Uh, I'm, I'm inter really interested to hear your thoughts in the comments, but let's finish this. It still has four pages. 
But in assessing whether a company exercises substantial market power, what matters is whether the alternatives are comparable. For today's digital platforms, nothing is. Now, wait a second. He's saying plural. Today's digital platforms, there's nothing comparable. He's listed five or six digital platforms and then said there's no competition. How, how can you do, you could say that there's one really powerful entity and then there's no competition. You can't say there's six or five or four or even three and say there's no competition. They're in competition with each other. If the analogy between common carriers and digital platforms is correct, then an answer may arise for dissatisfied platform users who would appreciate not being blocked. Laws that restrict the platform's right to exclude. When a platform's unilateral control is reduced, a government official's account begins to better resemble a government-controlled space. Let's read that again. When a platform's unilateral control is reduced, a government official's account begins to better resemble a government-controlled space. That is a really bad sentence. When a platform's unilateral control is reduced, without context, a government official's account begins to better resemble. That is, that is a conclusion without any reasoning. We would have to go through Mansky, which apparently has not been released yet, or has not been at least not been given a, a number here yet. We'll we'll take a look at that separately. And that apparently that case recognizes that a private space can become a public forum when leased to the government. So he's making the argument that was made in Knight First Amendment Institute versus Trump. That's exactly the case that he's just concurred with the dismissal as moot, by the way. Common carrier regulations, although they directly restrain private companies, thus may have an indirect effect of subjecting government officials to suits that would not otherwise be cognizable under our public forum jurisprudence. So he's saying that by regulating this as a common carrier this lawsuit would have been valid. It's, it's, a, it's a strange reasoning from a Supreme Court justice. This analysis may help explain the Second Circuit's intuition that part of Mr. Trump's Twitter account was a public forum, but that intuition has problems. First, if market power is a predicate for common carriers, nothing in the record evaluates Twitter's market power because market power had nothing to do with Trump's use of his Twitter account as a public forum. If he chooses to use Twitter to make presidential proclamations, it becomes a public forum. Where in that reasoning do you hear anything about market power? It has nothing to do with 89 million followers. It has to do with that's how he chose to make presidential proclamations. If he walked down to a private coffee shop near the White House, and that's where he made his presidential proclamations, then we'd be making the arguments, whether or not they'd be the exact same outcome, I don't know, but we'd be making the same arguments about who he can block from the coffee shop while he's making his proclamations there. If he leases a conference room at the local Marriott and makes his presidential proclamations from the Marriott, we'd be having this about the Marriott. Nothing in that needs to be evaluated for market power. Second, and more problematic, neither the Second Circuit nor respondents have identified any regulation that restricts Twitter from removing an account that would otherwise be a government-controlled space. So he's making the same mistake as everybody who confused the directionality of Twitter's power versus Trump's power. Trump was given the permission to use a private space, and then he used it for a government-related function. That doesn't mean that Twitter all of a sudden becomes a, a government-controlled space, the entirety of Twitter. It's just that one part, his account, that he used as a government-controlled space. So why would the Second Circuit have to identify any regulation that restricts Twitter from removing the account? There is no regulation. It's basic contract law, the terms of service. I obviously disagree with a Supreme Court justice here, and I'm actually a little bit perplexed that the Supreme Court justice would be so ignorant of these basic legal premises.
Even if digital platforms are not close enough to common carriers, legislatures may still be able to treat digital platforms like places of public accommodation. Although definitions between jurisdictions vary, a company ordinarily is a place of public accommodation if it provides lodging, food, entertainment, or other services to the public in general. Now that's from Black's Law Dictionary, and courts have discretion to defer to Black's Law Dictionary, but Black's Law Dictionary is not a, a precedential authority. He's also referring to a law that covers places of entertainment. Lodging, food, entertainment as a place of public accommodation of entertainment. This is the same place of public accommodation that we use for the Americans with Disabilities Act. So he's saying that a restaurant or a hotel or a stadium is considered a place of public accommodation for purposes of like the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is a different definition than a designated public forum for free speech. It's a different definition. Twitter and other digital platforms bear resemblance to that definition, so he's kind of acknowledging it. This too may explain the Second Circuit's intuition. Courts are split, however, about whether federal accommodations laws apply to anything other than physical locations. Yes, the Domino's case, which I'll put a bubble to with the Americans with Disabilities Act ruling, or the ruling regarding the Americans with Disabilities Act, that the website, because it governs access to a place of public accommodation, a physical place, that implicated the Americans with Disabilities Act. And he says that here, that he talks about the ADA and the Americans with Disabilities Act. So that's what he's doing. He's using this public accommodations law for the ADA and conflating it with Twitter's free speech discussion. Once again, a doctrine, he says, such as public accommodation that reduces the power of a platform to unilaterally remove a government account might strengthen the argument that an account is truly government controlled and creates a public forum, but no party has identified any public accommodation restriction that applies here. Because that doesn't apply here. That he that's a that's a really backhanded argument. And I mean backhanded like getting slapped in the face by a backhand. It's a very stabbing someone in the back argument. It's a stealthy argument. He's saying that no one identified this law that doesn't apply, so I suspect that it applies. Is a very, very weak argument from a Supreme Court justice. And, and it's a little scary. It's a little scary that a Supreme Court justice is using this backdoor argument. The similarities between some digital platforms and common carriers or places of public accommodation may give legislators strong arguments for similarly regulating digital platforms. It stands to reason that if Congress may demand that telephone companies operate as common carriers, it can ask the same of digital platforms. Skipping over the internet service providers, just completely skipping over the internet itself as a common carrier which it is currently not designated as a common carrier and therefore needed to be net neutral. Just keep that in mind. This is especially true because the space constraints on digital platforms are practically non-existent, so a regulation restricting a digital platform's right to exclude might not appreciably impede the platform from speaking. And he notes, unlike on cable companies, which again, aren't regulated as common carriers. Yet Congress does not appear to have passed these kinds of regulations. To the contrary, it has given digital platforms immunity from certain types of suits with respect to content they distribute, see Section 230, the Communications Decency Act, which it has not imposed corresponding responsibilities like non-discrimination that would matter here. I, another point that I want to make is what would happen to the internet if private websites had to host all speech? It would be disaster. It would be absolute disaster if you were if, if private companies were not allowed to remove speech that they disagree with on some level, either because it is wildly offensive, so everyone would have the right to go be as hateful as they want on everyone's private website, which would drive users who don't want to be that hateful away. In other words, I would not be using Twitter if Twitter was 4chan. For example, I would not use Reddit if Reddit was 4chan. And I suspect that that would happen to a lot of people. So what you're doing is saying that, say, a Macy's department store has to host all comers. And so therefore, dirty people, um, loud people, uh, messy people, 
anyone could come and basically destroy Macy's department store and Macy's could not kick them out. They could not pick and choose who to allow and who to not. And the justice is saying that because most people are fine, because they because because Macy's allows most people, they should have to allow everybody. And although we can definitely have a meaningful discussion over where that line should be societally, I don't disagree that the rule is that Macy's can choose to allow one person, no people, allow everyone, or have something in between. None of this analysis means, however, that the First Amendment is irrelevant until a legislature imposes common carrier or public accommodation restrictions, only that the principle means for regulating digital platforms is through those methods. Some speech doctrines might still apply in limited circumstances as this court has recognized in the past. Really, the a Supreme Court justice who believes in uh, the original meaning of the Constitution is saying that free speech has only ever applied in limited circumstances. I, again, disagree. It's very interesting that a justice whose political persuasion is one of less regulation, smaller government, more free speech, and free market competition is advocating for all of this big government regulation. That's really weird to me. For example, although a private entity is not ordinarily constrained by the First Amendment, it is if the government coerces or induces it to take action that the government itself would not be permitted to do so, such as censor expression of a lawful viewpoint. Consider government threats. People do not lightly disregard public officers' thinly veiled threats to institute criminal proceedings against them if they do not come around. What? The government cannot accomplish through threats of adverse government action what the Constitution prohibits it from doing directly. Under this doctrine, plaintiffs might have colorable claims against a digital platform if it took adverse action against them in response to government threats. That would be the state action doctrine. If the government threatened to shut down Twitter if Twitter didn't do something, that would be an argument through the state action doctrine. What is he saying? He continues, no threat is alleged here. What threats would cause a private choice by a digital platform to be deemed that of the state remains unclear. Okay. And no party has sued Twitter. I guess he means no party to this case has sued Twitter because we literally just went over the Rutenberg v. Twitter case. The question facing the courts below involved only whether a government actor violated the First Amendment by blocking another Twitter user. That issue turns, at least to some degree, on ownership and the right to exclude. Yes, the basic bundle of property rights, which includes the right to exclude. Private entities always have that right, except on the limited circumstances that we have described in our public forum cases when they act either under color of state law or with state action or when they engage in, like we said, that public accommodation situation where they are, uh, you know, like a, like a store, like a, like a Macy's department store or whatever, there are limited reasons why they can deny people. But those reasons are certain kinds of forbidden discrimination, not that they can't deny somebody based on them being loud and obnoxious or uh, using offensive language and scaring other customers away. Those are not protected classes for that public accommodation rule. The Second Circuit feared that then President Trump cut off speech by using the features that Twitter made available to him, but if the aim is to ensure that speech is not smothered, then the more glaring concern must perforce to be the dominant digital platforms themselves. As Twitter made clear, the right to cut off speech lies most powerfully in the hands of private digital platforms. He's, he's, a, he's a false equivalency. He's, again, equating Trump's offensive use of the Twitter platform, violating the Twitter terms of service, and Twitter cutting him off, with Trump's blocking of individual users. Those are not the same thing. Those are not equivalent. It is a fallacy, a false equivalency. The extent to which that power matters for purposes of the First Amendment and the extent to which that power could lawfully be modified raise interesting and important questions. This petition, unfortunately, affords us no opportunity to confront them. Um, this is a really terrible concurring opinion in my legal opinion. This is a blog post. 
this is better positioned as an opinion piece in a newspaper like publication and he would be a hosted opinion piece written by a Supreme Court justice. Instead, he has used the vehicle of the Supreme Court to write a concurring opinion that is just opening the discussion for this kind of, of legal situation, which is actually this legal situation is, is fairly defined and not nearly as ethereal and vague and muddy as he's trying to make it out with his false equivalencies and demanding that other people make arguments for him. We saw several times in here that he was upset that the parties didn't make the arguments that he wanted them to make. That's not the party's job to make arguments about inapplicable law. The parties make arguments using applicable law and fair extensions of applicable law. And it's not the justice's job to say, well, you should have made an argument about this other inapplicable law. That is cheap. That is backdooring a argument that doesn't belong in the house. And this is an opinion piece. This is, this is propaganda because it comes from a government entity as opposed to just an opinion piece that he should have written in a magazine-like publication, in my opinion. Now, it doesn't mean that there isn't a discussion to be had about when a Twitter-like entity becomes a designated public forum, but this is not it. This is, this is not that discussion, and this does not help that discussion by further muddying the waters. And my only reassuring factor is that this is one justice, and that this concurring opinion was not joined by the other justices. In other words, he is the only concurrence here when there were eight other justices that could have concurred. And so really this is an, not just not the opinion of a majority, not just a meaningless concurring opinion, but at least there were no other justices that joined in it as well. So he was the only voice that thought this. But still, one of nine Supreme Court justices, the final voice on matters adjudicated in the United States, thinking that this is a good legal analysis scares the hell out of me. Let me know what you think in the comments below. So that's our show. Thanks for joining me. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and this is Lawful Masses, your favorite legal news and education program here on YouTube, also on Floatplane and on twitch.tv at Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern time. This is a community-supported legal education channel, meaning we need your financial support on a monthly basis on patreon.com slash ljfrench, on sponsors.com slash law, or through YouTube membership or Floatplane membership. Thank you very much in April of 2021 to our $50 plus supporters, Joe Tyson, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Spirit Bear, Benjamin Hightoff, Ugly Grill, Rudolph Bescherer Jr., Torpedon, Brandon Abel, Sovereign Titison, Shadow Tycho, RDH Dragon, and Earthbound Star. And thank you very much to the $5 plus supporters. Everyone's been scrolling on the updated LED panel behind me and will be on the videos in front of me that drop. I love you all. Have a great week. I hope you all had a nice holiday weekend and I will see you in the videos. Bye.